All right. Well, good morning. We're going to talk about, uh, the, the title is Water to Blood. We're not going to talk a whole lot about uh, turning water to blood, but that is kind of the, p- the pivotal turning point in the story. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Kings chapter 3 is where we are today. 2 Kings chapter 3. Last week we, uh, we said goodbye to the prophet Elijah, and from here on we'll be carried by the prophet Elisha, who was uh, his apprentice, so to speak, and uh, he will continue on the prophetic ministry. So the turning point of the story today is, uh, is around God's intervention into a situation that Israel and their allies had come to the end and realized if God did not intervene um, that it would be a doom for them. And th- it is classic conflict escalation happening here. And so if you have had any experience where you have noticed in relationship with another or others that you've found actually you're at odds and things just continue to grow and boil, uh, you may find that actually you can relate to a lot of what's happening in this text. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of walk you through that conflict escalation as it pertains to Israel and Judah and the nation Moab, and we'll see how the conflict escalates, and then we'll see uh, they, them turning to God, which they should have done in the first place, and God intervenes, and God brings about, uh, uh, brings about a powerful end. And in the same way as Jesus in the garden, where people came at him, came against him, and he called his people not to rise up, not to, uh, to go into battle, but to actually to trust him, and God does the same thing here. Although in the Old Testament, there are often battle sequences, and so that is a bit of a, a, a difficult thing to, to wrestle with. Um, New Testament, we always see God actually calling us to love our neighbors and our enemies, regardless of, of how, we, uh, how we view them. So just a couple of quick updates, and then we will pray, and then we'll jump right into 2 Kings chapter 3. Uh, well done on the Food Greens postcards last week. You heard uh, Carolyn Austin standing and sharing uh, about the need to, uh, to help with small-scale farming, and how important that is globally and how we can make a difference by sending postcards to our Prime Minister. And we ran out of postcards. And so if you're interested in, in being supportive of that ministry, just click on our website. And if you are not uh, don't have access to our website, then uh, maybe talk to Carolyn and she can maybe help you to know uh, how best to do that without, uh, without web access. Uh, today is the last day. I apologize if it wasn't clear. I, I think the second service is a little less clear. Today's the last day for you to write letters of support or concern in regards to Pastor Amos and his step toward ordination. Uh, so all you need today is, you can even scribble something out handwritten. Ron DeVister, if you want to just wave, this is Ron, our chairperson of our ministry council. If you just want to uh, scribble something out and sign your name on it so Ron has something to take to the ministry council meeting. I know there have been some of you that have written letters. It's wonderful. And we want to give every opportunity for everyone to have a say in that. Uh, as well, uh, you'll notice, and if you're, uh, uh, my personality is such that I, I, I when I read things, I, I attuned often to punctuation or mis spellings or those sorts of things, and I did notice that on the uh, in the bulletin it's uh, $17,170, and on the screen it's one it's a $5 difference, so I'm not sure which one is accurate. Some of you might be like, hmm, what's going on there? I'm not sure. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of that, and we'll figure it out for next week. Uh, needless to say, $5 is not that much when you think about the amount that hasn't raised, and that's roughly five weeks of, of, uh, of raising these funds already, so well done. Uh, continue that, that, good, uh, that good giving, and uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, as well, Pastor Connie did note about the June meeting. I uh, just want to be clear that there is, uh, we do require you to come and vote. If you're a member, it is a vote on the budget. And it is you saying, yes, I agree to, to stand by this budget, to give to meet this budget. And it's not simply just uh, hearing information. It's actually your opportunity to come and, and say, yes, we approve this. And uh, an opportunity for, for questions and things like that. So, all right, let's jump into 2 Kings chapter 3. Let me read and uh, read the text. And here is what we'll be learning today, that God fights for those who obey Him. God fights for those who obey Him. Let's pray. Our Father, as we've been singing about your intervention, that you are able, um, when, uh, when, when opposition comes, when, um, when there's difficulty that we are facing in our lives, it's you that we need to be crying out to. It's you that we need to be seeking. It's you that we need to be asking for intervention from. Not from ourselves, not from the people around us, but God, you should be the first person that we turn to. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are not far off. Thank you that you are closer than a brother. Thank you that as we turn to your word, as we seek you in prayer, we become attuned to what you are asking of us. And there are times when you say, be patient, be still. And there's other times when you call us to action. 
Uh, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it is by your Spirit that we hear you speaking to us. And thank you for your Word. Thank you that it is by your Word that we hear with clarity what you are asking us to do. And so, Lord, as we spend time in your Word in 2 Kings today, as we spend time at your table in celebrating communion, as we reflect on your, your death and your resurrection, Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us. And I pray that we would hear you. And I pray that we would respond in obedience. So that as we go from here, we are finding that we are acting in greater and greater faith. That we are people that are saying, I am confident in God's unseen work. That I'm trusting him. That I have faith. That he knows what he's doing. And I'm simply going to follow him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Speak to us now, we pray in your name. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 3, um, Joram, the son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. Let me give you a, a bit of perspective. Now, uh, Ahab was the king of Israel. He was a wicked king, one of the most wicked kings that Israel has ever known. At this time, Israel is not one unified nation, but Israel is a northern kingdom, and there is a southern kingdom encompassing Jerusalem, and that is led by Jehoshaphat, and that southern kingdom is called the kingdom of Judah. At one time, they were all one unified kingdom. At this time, they are two distinct uh, kingdoms. And Israel never had, after they broke apart, after Solomon's reign, they, remember the, the, the kingdom broke apart, Israel never had a ruler that was fully devoted to serving God. All the rulers were wicked or evil or they, had, uh, they, they were bent toward destru- destruction. And so anytime you hear it, a ruler of Israel, when there's two separate kingdoms, uh, you know that the ruler of Israel, the northern kingdom, was not bent toward what God would want them to do. So what we have is Joram, who's the son of, of, uh, of Ahab. He's now the king in Israel. And the capital of Israel is Samaria. And I'll show you a map in a little while, and it might make a little more sense to you at that point. Uh, and we have Jehoshaphat, who's the king of the southern kingdom. And he seems to actually be a little better, although he doesn't have it. Uh, he's not perfectly oriented to, to the God that we serve and we worship. Verse 2, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal his father had made. Nevertheless, this is, uh, this is Joram we're talking about, nevertheless he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and he d- did not turn away from them. And if you want to go home, a little bit of homework, you can read about uh, Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 9. You can see more of, of, uh, of his sins. Verse 4, now Misha, the king of Moab, now this is a, a separate kingdom from Israel and Judah, a foreign kingdom. Misha, the king of Moab, raised sheep and he had to supply the king of Israel with 100,000 rams. Now, they were like a vassal state, okay? So they were subject to the the ruler of Israel. Moab was a state that was basically, uh, uh, the rule was imposed by Israel. And so they had to supply sheep to Israel. Now, when uh, Ahab died, the Moabites decided, we don't like this. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, when there's a leadership shift or transition or a leader dies and there's a new replacement leader that that needs to come forward, often there's a destabilization of the kingdom and uh, and this Misha decides that it's his turn to rebel, that he no longer wants to be a a vassal state. He no longer wants to supply that king with all these rams and he decides that he's going to rebel. Well, verse 5, but after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Now, what does this have to do with us today? Okay, We have this king, Joram in Israel. We have this king, uh, Misha in, in Moab. And basically, Misha, the king of Moab, decides, I'm no longer going to be subject to you, king of Israel, and I'm going to rebel. Maybe you've experienced this in terms of relationship with others. Here's some steps toward conflict escalation and ultimately God's intervention. The first thing we see is people will turn on you. Okay? People will turn on you. It happens. Okay? Uh, Whether they're meaning to turn on you 
uh, whether it's unintentional, uh, whether you see they've taken actions and you don't fully understand what's going on, but you can full well expect if you lay heavy burdens on another person, they will rebel. Okay? Parenting 101, right? The, har- the heavier the burden you place on your children, when they get to the place where they're able to cast that burden off, the heavier the weight that they're carrying, the greater the rebellion. Okay? Now I'm speaking to many of you and I'm on that journey right now, right? So I'm living some of this and some of you have lived this and some of you understand the need to be careful about how much weight and burden we place on our young ones and as they grow older. And certainly we want to instill discipline. We want to make sure self-discipline is the most important as opposed to external discipline. And it's a, it's a wonderful dance that we do with our children. We can do that in the workplace too, right? We can impose heavy burdens on the people that are, that are subject to us and either they will receive those heavy burdens or they may one day rebel. Parents, spouses, same thing, right? You can impose heavy burdens upon a spouse and they may choose to take it and one day they may decide, actually, I'm not going to do this anymore and then you've got, uh, you've got some conflict on your hands. So that all around you, uh, that when, uh, when there's heavy burdens placed, you can expect that people will turn on you. I agree. And my grandmother, growing up, she loved to can fruits. And she had a little orchard. And uh, I remember when I was quite young, we lived about five to eight kilometers away from my, from my grandmother's house. And sometimes my, my siblings and I would bike. I have an older brother. He's about seven years older. My older sister, she's about four years older. And me. And the three of us would bike because my parents both worked. And in the summertime, occasionally, we would bike to my grandmother's house. We'd spend the day with her. And then we'd bike home. And I remember one day, and maybe it was more than one day, but one day I remember she decided to send home these wonderful canned pears with us uh, on our bicycles. And all we had, we didn't have backpacks, all we had was grandma's plastic bags full of these glass jars with pears in them. And you can imagine, okay, riding. Now, if I remember this, my brother didn't have his driver's license, so he wasn't quite 16. So if you do the math, uh, I was in elementary school, my sister was perhaps in elementary school, I don't remember the exact ages, but we were not that old, biking along these backcountry roads with these plastic bags, trying to balance them with pears in them trying to do our best to make it home. My brother finally said, forget this. We're done with this. And he tossed them, he grabbed them all, and he tossed them into the ditch. And I don't think, I don't think we ever told our mother about that. And I don't know whether our, our grandmother ever asked her. But that was it, right? We cast off those restraints. We rebelled against grandma and her pears and what she was trying to do something good to us. And it, it, felt, like, it felt like a heavy burden. People would turn. We turned on our grandmother, right? We decided we, we, were not, we were not going to do that. People would turn on you, well-meaning or otherwise, and you may not know all the backstory of why they're turning on you, but the reality is people will turn on you, okay? Now, I suspect or I'm talking to a room full of people that, yeah, I've had an experience where, yeah, definitely somebody has, has turned on me. Okay, what happens next? This is classic conflict escalation 101. Verse 6. Uh, verse 6, where are we? So, at the time King Joram sent from Samaria and mobilized all of Israel. Uh, Joram decides, I'm not going to take this. Israel, were we are going to fight against this rebellion. And not only does this, and this is how you may respond, if somebody turns on you, your response may be to say, well, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to do something in return. And often what happens, verse 7, he also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And we do the very same thing. And he said, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go and fight with me against Moab? Are you on my side? And typically what happens when there's someone who turns against us, what's the first thing we do? We turn to someone else and say, did you know what this person is doing or has done? And we pick up the phone or we send the text message or we show up on their doorstep or the next conversation we have, we begin to talk to them about what's going on over here. And so what happens is we enlist the help of others. 
Will you help me in this situation? And often it's, will you help me to resist this? Will you help me to fight against this? And Jehoshaphat says, I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. The king of Israel, Joram, he mobilizes Israel and he enlists the help of the king of Judah. When someone turns on you, the odds are your reaction will be to reach out for help from someone. And it's well meaning. It's because you feel like I need help to deal with this situation and yet what often happens, it's a further escalation. Rather than turning around and going to the person who has just turned on you and saying, so for example if our grandmother had said, hey, is that a heavy burden? Yeah, grandma, that's a heavy burden. Can you wait for us to maybe get backpacks and then we'll, we'll bring those pairs home, right? But instead there could be a potential escalation because there's misunderstanding and all of those kind of things. And so you explain it, and uh, on the road we go, we say, did you know so-and-so did this? Did you know that they said this? Okay, we begin to, to share our experience and what happens from there. Verse 8, by what route shall we attack, he asks, and the response is through the desert of Edom, he replies, and what happens next is a plan is devised. We devise a plan of action. And often there's a growing number of people over here that we begin to say, what are we going to do about this rebellion? Never once did Israel say, is this fair to Moab to be doing this to Moab? We're actually oppressing Moab. Is that something that we should be doing? Is that a good thing to be doing? Uh, but instead they build this, uh, this force, this army against, and never once at this point do they consult and ask God, God, what do you want? Uh, what are you saying here? And as uh, conflict escalates, uh, there's a plan of action that's devised. And what's the plan of action that they devise? Here's the map that I was referring to. Uh, so if you see here, the kingdom of Israel is right here with Samaria, the capital, here. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Salt Sea down here. Here's the Kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem there. Okay, so the, this is Joram's territory, and this here is the territory of Jehoshaphat. And here's Edom. And now what they do is they enlist the help of the king of Edom as well. So rather than the two of them just going across to Moab, because Moab is the purple one here, they decide, let's do a well, let's loop down here and let's come up from the back end, let's come up from the other side, and uh, that, that's part of our plan of action. And that's often what happens with us as well, that we devise a plan that rather than to address uh, the person head on, rather than to actually seek clarification, we come through the back door, and we make an attempt to do something uh, that, uh, that is going to surprise or take someone off guard, and we don't actually seek what is, what is the, well, what's, let's get clear here about the original person that we're in conflict with with, and we begin to get a growing concert of people. We begin to gather a plan, and the plan gathers momentum. Just this past Friday, it was a PD day, and Shauna and Elijah, both our kids, had some chores to do. And in the evening, it was time for Shauna to go to, uh, to youth. And so uh, I ran her in and came back and found out that she had not completed her chores. And one of the chores she had not completed was the laundry. That was her job to do. And one of the challenges was that Elijah had something in the laundry that he really wanted to wear that evening. And he began to, to share his experience. His emotions started to come out. He was quite upset, quite angry. And I began to listen to this and think, oh my goodness. And you know what, you know what my natural inclination to do is, is to go, oh yeah, Shauna, you know, bad Shauna. Shauna sh and Shauna didn't do that. And, and Shauna this. And, and she, right? And you start to build this, this great narrative in your mind. And it's easy to begin to say, oh, and now Elijah is sharing these concerns and anger and frustration, and I'm hearing this perspective, right? And it's easy to create this whole wonderful narrative over here. And then to begin to address Shauna out of that narrative, instead of actually going, wait a minute, maybe I better ask Shauna what's up. The next day, Shauna actually, so I, I left it the next day, Shauna ended up saying um, at, the, at the table, she said, oh, by the way, I'm really sorry I didn't get the laundry done. Uh, I did, however, end up doing this and this and this. And, and Eric said, yeah, I did notice. Actually, the house was cleaner. And she said, so I'm going to finish the laundry today. 
And you see, all of a sudden, all of that stuff that had I gone in with this great long list of reasons why Shauna shouldn't, you know, da, 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 da. And you can fill in the blank with whoever it is that you may think of that you're sitting there going, well, that person, blah, blah, blah. But the question is, have you actually gone to that person directly? And have you sat down with them and trying to forget all of the stuff that you've heard already and asking them, hey, what's up? You had this job? Or you, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. These things came up and this, oh, okay, that makes sense, right? End of story. Instead of actually creating creating this whole long narrative over here and coming with that narrative and going, boom, here you go, right? You should have been doing this and you're blah, 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 blah. Okay, so be careful about that plan that you devise because it can be a plan that you're not actually fully hearing what's all happening. And so here they are. Now this, these two kings have actually enlisted the help of a third king and the king of Edom, and they decide they're going to go up and they're going to, um, to make their way up from the south instead of coming through the north. And what happens? Verse 9, So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Okay, and here's the next thing that happens. Your plan will fail. Your plan will fail. Uh, when you enter a situation like this and you find it's escalating, 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 you're getting all this help, your plan will fail. It will come crashing down. You will make, disa you'll make disastrous choices and it will have majorly bad implications for your original relationship with that other person and it will fail miserably. And they're marching around the desert. Never once have they asked God what God thinks. Never once had they asked God to intervene. Uh, uh, the northern king Israel saying, God had called us three things together. Where has God done that? Where do we see the voice of the Lord saying, this is what I want you to do and I'm asking you to do this. Uh, we don't actually see him saying, I wanted to assemble three kings here. Uh, your, your plan will fail. Uh, I've had numerous conversations and I've been part of uh, numerous situations uh, where, where the attempt is made to do something good and to rally people and it all comes crashing down. I think about uh, times when people have said, you know, um, th this person's uh, having a struggle and I need you to intervene in this person's struggle. This marriage is, is uh, having a really difficult go at it and I need you to intervene, right? And it's one perspective and you hear one perspective and you hear all the emotion that's attached to that, attached to that one perspective and and the plan gets developed and then you re come and realize actually you have no idea of the other perspective. And there's a whole other perspective. And all it took was somebody sitting down with that other individual, those other groups, and saying, what's your perspective in this? Oh, okay, that makes so much more sense, right? So there's a misunderstanding here and a miscommunication here. And before you know it, uh, uh, you've, got a, you've got a war on your hands. So your plan will fail uh, and, and uh, just be ready for it. Well-meaning. You're well, uh, I mean, we're all well-meaning in these sorts of situations, uh, but the plan will fail and things will come crashing down. And then what? You must seek God. Uh, seek God earlier in this process than later. And the sooner you seek God, the quicker you will have clarity and the quicker you will have the intervention of God. And this is what happens in verse 11. But Jehoshaphat, remember this is a southern king, Jehoshaphat asks, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? Jehoshaphat comes and in terms of seeing God's intervention, he says, uh, let's turn to a prophet. Let's turn and hear the word of the Lord because the prophet was the voice of the Lord. What is the word of the Lord saying? We turn to God's word. And today we don't look for prophets. Okay? There may be people, individuals that speak to us and we say, wow, that is the word of the Lord. But what we do is we turn to the scriptures and we say, Lord, what are you saying? What are you asking? And in the Old Testament, uh, they were asking for the prophet. Prophet, what is the prophet saying? Uh, and so this is what happens. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, he used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom went down to him. Turn to God's word. When you find yourself at odds with another, turn to the word of God. Turn to prayer. Uh, open up the scriptures. Open up the Psalms. Open up the New Testament. Open up the Old Testament. Open up the scriptures and begin to read. Begin to read and seek God and say, God, what do I do? And you will hear the word of the Lord. You will hear the voice of the Lord. You will hear God intervening. You will hear God speaking to you. But the first question is, are you turning to the word of the Lord? Are you opening the scriptures when you're at odds, when you're facing situations that your desire is to, is to maybe fight and God is saying, let me intervene. 
And would you let me speak? And so, when was the last time you turned to the Scriptures? And when was the last time you, you turned to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, would you intervene? Would you speak? And would you help me understand what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? Lord, would you speak? Would you help me to understand? So take time to pray. Take time to seek God. And see, notice when they seek God, they're not seeking God for an intervention for victory, right? They're not saying, God, lead us to victory. No, nope, they don't say that, right? They're saying, we're at a standstill. We're going to fight the Moabites. And we ran out of water. And our animals and our soldiers and everyone here is about to die. And they don't say, we need to not die. And they don't say, we need victory. They simply say, we need God. We need to turn to God, right? They don't have it figured out. They don't know what God's going to say. They don't know what God's going to do. They simply say, we need to turn to God. And so maybe you just simply need to drop your knees and say, God, I don't even know what to pray. I don't even know what to do. Uh, would you speak? Open the scriptures. Listen to the word. Well, going on from here, what happens? Elisha, uh, in verse 13, he said to the king, so he shows up and he says to the king, what do we have to do with each other? Uh, this is a wicked king he's speaking to, the wicked king of Israel. He says, go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Go to the, go, go to the, the, the prophets that, that, that seek other gods. Why are you coming to me? And the king of Israel says, no, because it was the Lord who called the three of us kings together to hand us over to Moab. And we still don't know whether that's true or not. Elisha doesn't confirm or deny that, but we don't see it in the scriptures. Uh, Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, uh, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, who's the leader of the southern kingdom, uh, I would not look at you or even notice you. Uh, now bring me a harpist. Here's the second, uh, second thing we, we recognize. When we come to the Lord, we, we turn to his word, and we listen for his rebuke. And God may rebuke you. And God may say, you need to stop doing what you're doing. And you need to repent. And you need to turn around. And you need to ask for forgiveness. And you need to take responsibility for the things you've done. And God does that. And it's called rebuke. And he says, you're not innocent here. Uh, it starts with you. And so he points and says, look, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, the rest of you I have no respect for. But Jehoshaphat, because he's standing in this group, then I will, I will speak the word of the Lord to you. And God may have difficult words for you to hear. He may call your attention to things that you're thinking or ways that you're living uh, that he may say, you need to do something differently about that. You are actively living in sin and you need to repent and you need to turn and you need to come back to the Lord Jesus. So listen for his, rebu his rebuke. He will rebuke you. Because you're a sinner. He rebukes me because I'm a sinner. Uh, he constantly will do that. And it's Jesus who intercedes for us. And it's Jesus who says, uh, now I will make a way for you. And then after this, it goes on to say, while the harpist was playing. By the way, it's interesting how there's this musical thing, right? That, that sometimes God speaks and comes uh, through a musical intervention. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. And he says, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Did you hear that, how explicit that is? Dig ditches in this desert valley. Dig ditches, okay? The next thing we realize is that God will speak of his provision, okay? But his provision only comes after obedience to his commands, okay? God says, dig ditches first, and here's how I'm going to provide, okay? And often God will simply say to you, I want you to dig ditches. Why, God? Dig ditches. Why, God? Just dig some ditches, and at, only after will I reveal to you my provision. You can trust my provision. But notice that it's verse 16 that says, dig ditches. And God says, be obedient, just dig ditches. And it's verses 17 and 18 that later then clarify, why are we digging these ditches? And it says this, for this is what the Lord says, you will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. And you, your cattle, and the other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. And he will also hand Moab over to you. You will over throw every fortified city and every major town. You will, you will cut down every good tree and stop all the springs and ruin every good field with stones. And the next morning, what happens? They dug the ditches and they, while the, at the time of the sacrifice there was water flowing in the direction from Edom, filling those ditches. Do you realize that God may call you and say, 
this is highly relevant to you. You're standing in a valley and I'm asking you to dig ditches and I'm not really going to tell you why. Why only after will you realize why I'm asking you to dig ditches? Uh, think about Abraham and Isaac and as they're walking up uh, uh, Mount Moriah and Isaac clues in and says, look, we have a fire and we have, <laughs> we have the sticks. Where's the offering? Right? And God had simply said to Abraham, go and offer your son as a sacrifice. You obey me and when you are ready to obey me and when you are actually obeying me, then I will show you the provision. You dig the ditches, and while you're digging the ditches, then I'm going to tell you, by the way, I'm going to fill these ditches with water. And this water is going to supply food for, it's going to supply drink for your animals and for you. And by the way, it's actually going to uh, give you victory in the war as well. And so he goes on to say, uh, verse 21, Now the Moabites has heard that the kings had come out to fight again, so every man, young and old, who could bear arms was called up and stationed on the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water, to the Moabites, uh, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. These kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to the plunder, Moab. So they looked and they saw this water and it looked like blood. And they thought all of the Israelites and the Edomites and the, and the, the Judites had, had all assembled. And they thought they had killed all, all of them. And so Moab goes running out. And then Israel comes against them and brings victory. And they attack them. And they go and do all the things that God had said that he had asked them to do. Obedience. Uh, what's God asking of you? What's he saying to you? And maybe you're waiting for him to disclose to you the provision. Maybe he's saying, uh, I want you to do this. And you're like, well, why, do I, why would I do that, God? It's risky. It's not safe. It doesn't make much sense to me. Why would I dig ditches in the desert? Why would I sacrifice my son for Abraham? And God says, I will provide. And I will disclose to you the provision once you do the obedience part. So what is God asking of you? Uh, uh, servers, why don't you come? And we'll, we're going to, um, to uh, celebrate communion today. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table. And I invite you to reflect on seeking God. Are you seeking God? Are you obeying what He is asking you to do? There's something particular that He is asking you to do. What is that particular thing? Something that's highly relevant to where you are and yet very difficult to do. Something that requires faith. What is he asking you to do? And what's standing in the way of you doing it? As you come to the table, may you spend a bit of, uh, a bit of time saying, Lord, what is it that you're actually asking me to do? And then what do, you want, what do you want me to do with that? You want me to actually do that? Okay, God, I will do that. And I invite you when you're ready to say, Okay, God... I will be obedient. I know what you're calling me to do. Then uh, I invite you to, uh, to take the communion and we'll take that together. We're going to pass out the bread and, uh, and then we'll pass out the cup and we'll do that in one, uh, one movement. Uh, but let me just uh, offer you a text for you to meditate on uh, from Psalm chapter 40. And I invite you just to close your eyes before the communion servers actually move anywhere. Just close your eyes and take a moment to reflect and see yourself in this text. Close your eyes and, and envision yourself. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me. Envision him turning to you. And he heard my cry. What's your cry? He lifted me out of the slimy pit. See yourself being lifted out of that pit. Out of the mud and mire. And he set my feet on a rock. And he gave me a firm place to stand. See yourself standing on that rock. And as you receive the bread and as you receive the cup, listen, what is the Lord Jesus saying to you as you stand on that rock? He's lifted you out of the mire and the muck. And what is he saying to you and how is he calling you to respond? Let's pray and then we'll pass out the, the bread and the cup. Lord Jesus, thank you for your call in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your death, for your resurrection. Thank you that you have taken our sin upon you and in so doing you have lifted us out of the slimy pit and you've set our feet on a rock. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your faithfulness. Jesus, thank you that you are speaking to us here and now today. Would you find within each of us the capacity and the willingness to say yes, yes, Jesus, I'm afraid but I know what you're asking me to do and I'm saying yes to you today. 
Thank you, Jesus. As we reflect on your sacrifice, on your death, and your resurrection, would you continue to instill within us the confidence in your unseen work, the faith to be able to follow you wherever you ask us to go. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pass out the bread and the, and the cup, and we will eat and drink them together. Paul said to the Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to, the, on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you haven't already taken the bread, let's, let's take the bread together. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup now. I invite you to stand. We're going to pray and then the worship team can come and there's one final song and and you are released uh, if you want to go, if you want to stay and sing. uh, By all means, you're welcome to. But let's stand and we we will close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body. Thank you for your life. Thank you, Jesus, that you came, you lived, you were a human being, you continue to be, you were put to death innocently for our sin. Jesus, thank you for all the wrongs I have done. They are washed free. I'm set free in you. Thank you that the same can be said for each of us. And as we stand here and as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we're reminded that you are present, you are powerful to save, you're here to forgive, and you're here to send us out. Lord Jesus, Cause us to continue to come back to remembering, be obedient to you, Lord Jesus. To turn to your word. In times when when we're trying to claw our way through situations, Lord, may we turn around and seek you. May we turn to your word. May we listen to your, your rebuke. May we listen to your provision and may we be responsive to you as you call us to obey. Send us forth now in obedience, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. Sweet the sound that says